So let me get started. Multiple choice, Pendo says. Um, so you know the deal. You, you got 10 minutes, 10 questions, <laughs> about a mini per question. And uh, these questions can be challenging. So that's really the main reason you have three attempts allowed because um, you are going through this in a really tight amount of time. And, um, and uh, so, so, you know, the first attempt, that's your practice attempt to see how well that goes. And uh, depending on where, so, you know, if you score something like seven or eight out of 10, that's great. That's a, a level performance. And, uh, and in your, any additional attempts that you might have to, that um, what if, so since the system keeps your best score, whatever you have scored, you are not risking that at all with the additional attempts. Um, but you know, if you score like two or three, which is basically, which basically means you're just guessing, then my encouragement is uh, that you should study. Uh, the, try to figure out what you are missing out and um, study and prepare before you use the remaining attempts. So with that, I feel prepared enough. So let me start. I'm uh, just watching the time so that I kind of have a sense of. Uh, by the way, I think there was an update to the system. Was there an update? Wait, what? That is so weird. So um, on my other thing, this was scrolling with me, but here it's not. I'm so confused. Um. All right, uh, let me just uh, keep going. <laughs> I'm looking at the time. I guess that'll be enough. Um, why isn't this scrolling with me? Uh, okay, well, let me not waste any more time and get started. It says, suppose a hypothetical unstable particle with a... Okay, so we have some proper lifetime, and we have a lifetime measured in the lab frame. So with these two pieces of information, what the question is essentially giving us is the gamma factor. So with these two pieces of information, the gamma factor should be the time dilated time, 12 microseconds, divided by the, the proper time, 4 seconds. So this is what the, the piece of information that the question is giving. So what you really need to calculate is beta, because all these are meant to represent beta. Uh, I have this formula memorized. I'm just going to use it. It's square root of 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. I think you've seen me use this in lecture quite a few times. So um, let me use the sage math for this. Um, so let's see. 1 minus, so 1 over 3 squared, that's 1 over 9. So 8 over 9, square root it. Yeah, I can't do that reliably enough in my head to um, <laughs> choose between very close numbers. Um, so let me, I'll just wait for this to finish booting up. And, and I strongly recommend that you set all this up before you start your 10 minute timer. Um, don't do what I'm doing now. Just, you know, make sure everything is around already before you start the clock. So square root of eight is what? Oh wait, I'm not. Okay, so square root of one minus one over three squared. Okay, uh, come on, man. Um, this forces it to the uh, decimal approximation. Okay, so it's this one. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, consider two spaceships, each traveling by say straight line uh, from when the sun measures the speed of light coming from the sun. Okay, second postulate of special relativity: on both ships, speed of light is c. So one of those questions where, uh, it, it, uh, as long as you trust second postulate, um, you can get the correct answer really quickly. No. Now, understanding it is another matter. That's what the examples of the special relativity paradoxes are for. Okay, uh, cosmic ray muons are unstable particles. Um, muons lifetime frame is about that. Um, because how much? 
Oh yeah, as measured in muons on rest frame. So there's no time dilation to talk about. It's uh, basically this speed times that. So I'm just gonna do that. That's it. Um, so 2.2 microseconds times 0 0.999 times speed of light, three times 10 to the power of eight. Um, so 659 meters or 0 0.66 kilometers. And, you know, in muon's own rest of frame, it's the Earth moving closer to muon, not the muon moving closer to Earth. What it is, what did the uh, interferement, uh, this is uh, one that failed to detect ether drift, or, you know, another way of putting it, speed of light is the same value in any state of motion, in whichever, um, so as Earth orbits the sun, uh, we, there's no, like, relative speed, uh, they didn't detect any change of speed of light. Um, points are to fraternal twins, Bob sets off. Uh, that's the speed of the spaceship. It takes Bob up by reach by the back, Bob returns to Earth. Okay, that's how old, how old is he? Um, he should be younger. This is the twin paradox. And uh, with the one minute per question, I'm not expecting you to explain twin paradox, but you should at least know the correct answer. <laughs> Let me move on. Uh, pressure. Uh, so this is kind of the other side of the second postulate of special relativity. Um, with something like sound, uh, which travels in air, there is a special reference frame, reference frame where the air is at rest. So. This is how fast the sound is moving relative to air. If the airplane, hence the air, is moving at this speed, so uh, from the back to the front of the airplane, so this speed is adding to the speed of sound. So the the observer should, uh, from the ground, should see the sound moving at 620 meters per second. So, uh, yeah, if it's the other way, from the front to the back of the airplane, they would subtract. Okay, how does the correspondence principle, which is basically saying that the classical physics, which are now in the process of correcting with the modern physics, it's not completely wrong. Um, it's a good approximation of the modern physics within the regime where they were experimentally tested. So in spectral relativity, where the thing that you're concerned, you are concerned with is how fast are things moving relative to speed of light, you would say, yeah, everyday low velocities, relativistic equations like relativistic energy, relativistic momentum, they approach Newtonian terms. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that relativity requires a whole new way of thinking. That's not wrong, but correspondence principle applies even when something is paradigm changing because it's uh, experimentally grounded. Okay, how much time do I have? Okay, three minutes. What is the total energy of a proton moving with this speed in terms of, um, yeah, so um, the here it's kind of, you have to remember the formula that we covered last week. The total energy, total relativistic energy is gamma mc squared. So it's basically asking you to compute gamma, which is given by one over square root of one minus beta squared. You are given the beta, so plug in the numbers and get gamma. That will basically give you the answer. Uh, one over square root of one minus 0 0.9 squared. So 2.29, 2.29, and then and the rest energy uh, expression. Okay. Uh, question nine, uh, how many joules of energy are required to accelerate one kilogram mass from the rest to the velocity of, okay, I think it's asking, yeah, how many required to accelerate, okay, so it's uh, the amount of work you do that goes into kinetic energy, so I need to plug this into kinetic energy formula, which is the total energy minus the rest energy, so, uh, so, or one over square root of um, zero point one minus zero point eight 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 six six squared. Okay, wait, wait. That's uh, uh, that's the total energy, um, and minus one. That's the rest energy times the mass one kilogram times the c squared three e eight squared. Okay, 
Um, 9 times 10 to the 16. Okay. Um, how much time? One minute. Okay. Uh, the atomic bomb was how much mass was con okay. Um, okay. So it's this is a kind of unique conversion, you know. So 20 kilotons of TNT, that's uh, uh, the amount of energy we're getting to in the unit of kilotons of TNT. I have that. So, you know, 4.3 times 10 to the power of 12 joules, that's uh, uh, 1 kiloton, 20 kiloton. Uh, that's the amount of energy. Um, now, I'm equating that with the mc squared and dividing our c squared to get the value of m. So divide by 3 times 10 to the power of 8 um, squared. Okay. So that's in kilograms. So multiply that by 1 minus 3. Uh, so, uh, well, sorry. So 1 gram. I think that's right. Um, okay, I have 20 seconds. Let me just double check. One gram, that sounds so super small. Um, well, maybe that's right. 20 kilotons, one kiloton. I think that's right. Uh, we'll see <laughs> if I missed something. If I did, then we'll, um, you know, I'll try to figure out what I missed. I always joke it'll be embarrassing if I don't get 100%. And sometimes I do miss some things that's happened before. So, so yeah, the, the, that's a kind of sampling of um, multiple choice timed assessment. And I think I demonstrate this with the optics. Um, it, these questions come from a relatively large pool, which is why. Um, I uh, so you know when I do this demo, basically what you have will have seen is about a, uh, I think a, less than a fifth of the pool. So like the your first two group of questions, there are four um, in that group. I think this is basically oh wait <laughs> with the special relative, there's only one chapter, chapter five, but this is uh, what we covered in our first week, um, and the, those four questions are coming out of twenty three questions. And this is what we covered in the second week of special relativity, three out of the uh, 13 questions. And this last group is what we covered last week, um, three out of uh, 17 questions. So uh, the, the four, three, three questions that you have seen so far is about a, a fifth of the, the, the whole size that it comes from. Well, hopefully this uh, gives you some sense of uh, what level of preparation you need. Um, and with the, the acknowledgement that it, uh, um, uh, someone who, who gets uh, like a 70%, 80% on this, you should be getting an A. That's, uh, as I said, it's that's an A-level performance. Uh, I should get 100% because I wrote these questions and actually remember many of the answers without working through, but uh, you know, you didn't write the question, so it's not the same expectation that applies. Okay, so that's the uh, multiple choice. Um, if, I, if there isn't any questions or anything that's confusing, uh, this is due on Friday, so uh, make sure you, as you are working through the the quantum mechanics introduction this week, make sure you are also looking to do this and preparing for it to complete it by Friday. If you need more time, you can use the lay passes. So, but you know, do try to finish by Friday if possible. Um, if there are any specific questions? Let me uh, do the free form time assessment. The questions you see here are. Uh, questions that I basically programmed in from uh, past midterm exams. And um, and the 20 minute amount of time, it's again a bit tight. It's closer to the amount of time I used to give for midterm exam as in usually the midterm exam was structured in a way, you're about an hour you're supposed to spend on uh, multiple choice, the other hour you're supposed to spend on free form portion and I usually the three free form questions. So, you know, 20 minutes, that's about right. Um, what you lose out on in this format is the flexibility because sometimes people would finish um, the multiple choice questions a lot more quickly 
like in 30 minutes and have more time left over for free form. Or sometimes as you're doing free form, you would recognize a question is difficult, skip it, do the other easier questions first. And with the more difficult question, you would have, I don't know, 40 minutes to work on it. And um, in this format, you, it, you know, it's just something that you lose out of, that you don't, that you don't have that flexibility that um, most of the questions should be of similar difficulty, but you know, there's some variation. And even if you are unlucky enough to get harder question, you will uh, still only have 20 minutes. I think the balancing thing will be the, the ad work feature. It's uh, available after you submit your answer. So, um, so, you know, during the 20 minute time limit, really your focus should be uh, getting to the correct answer and putting it in the answer box as a proof of what you have completed during the 20-minute time limit. And, uh, and, you know, if you need to organize your work and uh, make everything uh, neat and understandable from someone else's perspective, you should do that after the 20-minute time limit. So with that, I'm going to start. I don't know what question I'll get. Other than it's a random question from the poll. Oh, wait, before I start, I should have this all set up so that I don't waste precious time working on this a virtual class session. Hmm. Oh, wait, I don't need this. Okay. I think I'm all set. Let me start here. Okay, so this is the question. It says, consider a hypothetical unstable particle of some mass decaying with two particles. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so the picture that they are asking us to consider is so I have some particle of some mass, and um, this would be before and after whatever interaction is going on. This uh, particle breaks up into two identical particles. Of, so there's two M's. There's a one M on another M, and they split up. And um, now, as you are looking at these numbers, if you're looking at you know 2m that's less than m hopefully by now um, after you know last week's uh, coverage of special relativity dynamics the fact that your mass changes is not surprising to you that difference in the mass is going to the kinetic energy of these particles that are flying apart from each other so they are moving away from each other with some speed of it and so part A asks, uh, consider the interaction in the center of momentum frame where the total momentum of all particles in the system is zero. So in this picture, that just means, oh, before the, the breakup, this was just at rest. It wasn't going anywhere. So that the momentum of the single particle could be zero. Uh, what are the kinetic energies of the two particles of mass M? Yeah. So here, as I was drawing it, I kind of intuitively um, gave them the same speed, and that's actually the way it has to be, so that the momentum will be conserved in this center of, so in this center of moment, in this center of momentum frame, that uh, the total momentum is equal to zero. So these two having the same speed, that's necessary to conserve momentum from the before picture in the center of momentum frame. So um, it asks, what are the kinetic energies of the two particles of mass M? Hmm. Okay, I think that seems simple enough. So let me write out uh, expressions this way. So I'm so um, I'm using conservation law. Uh, so. I'm going to be using conservation of energy. So let's just write down expressions for energy. Um, the expression for energy of the before would be, well, my total energy 
here was uh, just the rest energy, mc squared. No kinetic energy, it's not moving, nothing. Um, in the after picture, I guess I could write down the energy for one of them and I just uh, double it since it's uh, symmetric and all that. So after the breakup, the total energy would be, well, whatever gamma corresponds to that, it will be uh, gamma corresponding to the speed of V times the mass of the thing C squared and uh, times two since there's two of them. So that's the total energy after the breakup. And, um, and co what conservation of energy says is that this expression for energy should be equal to this expression of energy because energy didn't change in the process. So mc squared is equal to gamma v small mc squared times two. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, so what is it asking? It's asking what are the kinetic energies of the two particles of mass m? Well, um, the expression for kinetic energy. So if I'm just uh, looking at this mass here, um, so, you know, the total energy is gamma mc squared. And we covered in the lecture how uh, the way we like to look at kinetic energy is it's well the total energy minus the, the what we have come to call rest energy. So gamma mc squared minus mc squared or gamma minus one mc squared. And I hope you notice here that this gamma mc squared is already here. So I already have that. And mc squared only depends on quantities that I already know. So, you know, if I'm uh, kind of breaking up this expression on the right hand side in terms of the rest energy and kinetic energy, the rest energy portion would be this 2mc squared. This is my rest energy. And the kinetic energy portion is basically whatever I need to add so that I come back to this. So that's going to be 2 times gamma v minus 1 mc squared. So this portion is the kinetic energy. Now, I guess the challenging thing here is that, um, so when you look at these uh, parameters here, gamma is not here. Uh, so uh, how, what do I do with the gamma? I hope it doesn't take you too long to look at it the other way because uh, really what you want is the expression for kinetic energy. So I can just look at the remainder, you know, this here that I know, this here in terms of all the parameters there. So I can actually just solve for this kinetic energy saying, okay, that kinetic energy piece is equal to the original left-hand side mc squared minus the rest energy uh, moving this over to mc squared. So this would be the total kinetic energy. And uh, that's it. And I think a lot of people might be able to get to this uh, expression kind of intuitively, you know, the mass difference um, being uh, kind of converted into kinetic energy, which, uh, you know, it's not <laughs> incorrect. <laughs> I might quibble with uh, um, some se semantics of it, but uh, yeah, if you're getting at the answer here through that route, that's also fine. Here, I'm just trying to do it more properly. So um, the total kinetic energy would be mc squared minus um, two times mc squared or uh, kinetic energy per particle is uh, the half of that. Uh, so it would be m times c squared over two minus two cancels out, small m times c squared. Um, and I'll attach the work quiz showing that, oh, n give a numerical value of the kinetic energy in electron volt units. That's where I look at these numbers. See the C squares will cancel this stuff out um, and say, oh, so total key, kinetic energy is just difference between them. Eight, uh, not 800, 1000 minus twice 200, so 600 MeV um, or K per particle, just half of that, uh, 300 MeV, um, and C is cancel out. 
By the way, I think I randomized the question so that these numbers are not necessarily the same. So, you know, read the question, actually work through it, even if you are lucky enough to get this exact question. Yeah, in it. Okay, I gotta go faster. Um, in this center of momentum frame, what are the speeds? Oh, so this is a kind of a, a fun one. Um, so this took me a long time to develop this uh, sense of intuition for um, relativistic dynamics, which parameters are useful, which are less useful. So what we do have is the total energy for one of those small m particles is gamma mc squared. And I have a, a numerical value for that. So, you know, the kinetic energy of a particle is 300, rest energy is 200. So that total energy is 500 MeV. And uh, I already know that from the given values, mc squared is 200 MeV. So by knowing the total energy, and by looking at how what kind of change you need to get to gamma, uh, knowing these two pieces of information, the total energy and the rest energy, actually gives me gamma right away. Gamma is 500 divided by 200, you need to cancel out, 5 over 2. That's gamma. And the reason I'm getting to gamma first, even though it's asking for the speeds, is because um, from having worked in this relativistic dynamics for a while, I realized that gamma is often the easier parameter to work with. And once you have gamma, it's just a single step remaining to work out any other quantity you want, like the beta, speed of um, the things in the, uh, as a fraction of speed of light. It, uh, so, you know, you, you have, take this expression, gamma is one over square root of one minus beta squared, solve it for beta, when you have done that, you will get beta is equal to one minus one over gamma squared, uh, square root it. So once I have gamma, I can just plug it in here. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, saying, uh, what are the speeds of the two identical particles? Give their speeds as a fraction of speed of light. Yeah, so it's uh, looking for a numerical answer. So let me just plug in the numbers. Um, so square root of one minus one over gamma squared. So that would be five divided by two. I'm putting that dot there to force a decimal approximation. Squared, so 0. Point, oh, I, I guess that's, I don't know. I'll just use three significant figures. Um, we is equal to 0. 0.917C. Um, in this highly relativistic situation. Uh, there might be some other set of numbers generated where it might be more relativistic. Here, eh, a little bit, not that much. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, suppose that the hypothetical particle of mass m is actually moving at that speed in the left ray. The particles of mass m are emitted along the direction. Yeah. What are the total? So this is, um, it's a Lorentz transformation question. It's uh, one of the ways that I would uh, like to like you to learn how to uh, handle special relativistic dynamics, which leans rather heavily on the knowledge that this quantity forms a, a four vector. It's an energy momentum four vector with energy in the or energy divided by c in the time component of the four vector like the coordinates, space-time coordinates, and the momentum forms the spatial three dimensions of that four vector. So um, once you fully get that, then um, you can use a Lorentz transformation on this. So if you want the, the, the energy and the momentum values, so let me just deal with the, only the X component. If you want the, the values of energy and momentum, um, in a Lorentz boosted frame, then all you need to do is take the energy and momentum in some original rest frame, where original reference frame where you know their values already, and apply the Lorentz transformation. Think the gamma minus gamma beta minus gamma beta 
um, uh, if you know how to do matrix multiplication, then it's a rather simple calculation. So, um, so the your low end transformed energy is. Uh, I'm gonna work in units of C is equal to one because it's quicker. <laughs> Uh, so gamma times that, uh, gamma E minus gamma beta, the momentum component, and your Lorentz transformed momentum will be uh, minus gamma beta E plus gamma original momentum. So um, yeah, let me just, uh, so I think I'm just going to do this in Sage Math, uh, the rest of it. Um, I guess if you are doing what I'm doing, then you should include the screenshots of your CAG method or whatever as your work. So let me just declare some of the variables. Um, I need the E prime, I need the beta, uh, I need the momentum X, momentum X prime, I think that's everything. Okay, so my, oh, I didn't have to declare some of this. Um, so my, the, Transform the momentum is gamma times E minus gamma times beta times Px. Yeah. And my transformed uh, momentum is minus gamma times beta times E plus gamma times the original momentum. Okay, so it, um, what are the, Total energies. Yeah, so I have to compute this uh, uh, separately. One of the particles will have more more energy and the other one will have less energy. So for one of the particles, I can consider the particle that was moving, um, particle that was moving in the same direction as M. So for that particle, uh, Px should be in the same direction as that. Yeah, then Px should be um, uh, what I calculated above. Um, so the gamma um, mv or gamma, so an important part is a plus gamma m beta c. And I'm going to be using that number that I calculated above of beta, uh, so let me just copy and paste it as beta is equal to that. Oh wait, that's, um, I need to track two different values. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna do this. Uh, Px is equal to um, beta two is equal to the value uh, so because it, gamma and beta here it refers to the relative velocities between the frames. What I'm referring to as beta two is the um, is the um, it, it's the uh, it, it, it's the the speed of the particles in the center of momentum frame. So and gamma two should be one over square root of one minus beta two squared. Okay, I have that. So let's uh, get the new um, total energy. So EX, EP should uh, substitute in uh, gamma is equal to, um, uh, so uh, let me substitute in beta first, which is 0 0.95. That's the number given here. And, um, and then substitute in, um, Gamma is equal to one over square root of, yeah, I think I, yeah. There are more efficient way to do it, but let me just do it this way so that I don't run out of time. Um, yeah, and then I have to substitute in uh, energy of, uh, before we had um, uh, 500 MeV for total, I think, yeah. 500 MeV for total. And for momentum, it's going to be that gamma two times beta two times uh, the rest mass, uh, rest energy is 200 MeV per C squared. So, yeah, gamma two. Yeah, so that's it. Um, so I think that's actually the particle that's moving in the opposite direction. So, uh, 
energy of uh, lower energy particle is 207.063 MeV. Uh, energy of higher energy particle. So it's the same calculation. The only thing that you are changing is your for the momentum. This becomes minus because uh, it was going in the opposite direction. And yeah, it's a lot higher <laughs> energy of the higher energy particles. Two nine nine five point five uh, zero zero MeV. Um, and the speeds of the two particles, um, it, it, they are going to be very different. So, um, so once you have the total energy, then uh, let me just do the calculation this way. 207.063 divided by the rest energy, that gives me gamma right away. That's what I was pointing out earlier above. Um, so that's the gamma for the lower energy particle. So for beta, it will be square root of 1 minus 1 divided by the previous output squared. That's the beta for that other particle. So uh, speed of lower energy particle is 0 0.258895C. Speed of higher energy particle, this is where you really have to put in a lot of significant figures to make sure that um, it's distinguishable from uh, from C. So um, it'll pull from the previous output and, oh, okay, maybe not that much, just 0 0.9978C. Uh, let me just use the same significant figures. So, oh, eight seconds left. Uh, uh, use time dilator. Okay. Uh, did I say? So, you know, okay, saved. Okay, good. <laughs> so, yeah. So, if I had watched the time, I would have gone through this a little bit more quickly so that I can work it out. So, because it's relatively easy. Because uh, given that V, um, you have gamma of uh, 1 over square root of 1 minus 0 0.9 squared. Um, that's gamma. So the time dilation, um, it's going to be this factor, factor which is greater than one times this that gives you the, the it gives you the lab lifetime. So this times one times 10 to the power of minus six. Um, so 3.2 times 10 to the power of minus six. That's what the answer there is. So uh, this is what I would uh, recommend, you know, if you see yourself running out of time, um, do put something in. That's why I put this in. Um, leaving it blank versus putting something in that's incomplete. It's two different thing because when I put this in, then I kind I'm signaling that I know how to do it. I just ran out of time. Whereas when it's completely blank, uh, maybe you didn't know what to do. <laughs> that's always a possibility. So the lab life lifetime, which is gamma times the uh, proper lifetime is equal to with all these numbers using um, for beta equal 0 0.95 um, in the C is the here the lifetime is 3.20 times 10 to the minus 6 second. So um, depending on the significant how much is missing, uh, you might not get full credit. But it's always better to have something here than have a completely blank thing. And the work that you attach, um, it again, it, that is not time limited. So uh, especially if you find the mistakes or like one of the things I'd like to double check is um, these two energies added together should be the energy of the the hypothetical particle. Let me just double check that is the case. So the the energy of the original particle it should be gamma mc squared and here the gamma is 1 over square root of uh, 1 minus 0 0.9 squared oh, yeah that's gamma times uh mass of the particle was thousand mev or c squared uh, and then times the c squared that cancels out so yeah so that's 3200 so that's the total starting energy and these two added together should be equal to that, and I think they are. So good. <laughs> I'm less worried about this being wrong. Um, 
so yeah, it's, uh, you should organize your work. Uh, if uh, you might have made the mistakes within the time limit, it's totally okay for you to um, reflect that understanding in your attached work. Um, the only thing that I am holding you to is that, you know, you are still under the honor code. You uh, no outside help is allowed. Um, so. so let me attach work. Um, so in terms of work, what I will need to do is let me just grab a screenshot of this and attach that. Um, so that's for part A. By the way, I do recommend that you organize it a lot more than how much you see me organize. Like this, all, this is all scratch work. You should spend a little more time organizing it than I am. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, rushing through it so that I can do some other stuff during this virtual class session. And for part to see, I think this is how I'll have to do it. So I have this uh, scratch work <laughs> that's kind of illustrating the um, the algebraic work that I have done and needed to add and have done. And the calculation itself, I kind of did it in Sage Math. And so I want to just to make sure I include the enough a portion of Sage Math um, to capture that. So I think I'm using this value yet. So let me just go from here to, I guess I need a, this portion. This is just me writing out some of the things I need to do. Oh wait, yeah, let me do through here. And then I'm just going to skip over the error message. Like I don't need to see your programming error messages. Um, so the corrected expression here, yeah, and the rest uh, and the captures that, yeah. That's just me double checking. That's part, uh, that's part D. So I think through here is right, yeah. All of this is my work for part C. So, you know, something like this, uh, mainly it's uh, the goal of work always is I should be able to follow your reasoning process. Um, and uh, it, it it especially matters when there might be mistakes. Um, because I, oftentimes, you know, when I see correct uh, answer and cor uh, reasonable amount of work, I assume that, yeah, you understood everything and you did everything properly, correctly. Um, it's when the answer seems to be wrong. That's where I kind of want to figure out where you might have gone wrong so that I can give you the correct amount of partial credit. And that's where uh, the more work you show, the better chance there is. I can figure out where you went off and um, give you correct deserving amount of partial credit on the parts that you didn't really miss. So yeah, so that's it. Let me just uh, save work and continue. And uh, that's all there. By the way, um, especially if you're doing this uh, towards the um, end of the due time, like if you're doing this Friday late at night, uh, close to midnight, uh, be careful that sometimes the system will kick you out uh, while you may be attaching work. Um, now, you do have access to this after you uh, after the due date. Like, uh, you know, if I just refresh here, you will see my access to add work. Like, you can access this after you've submitted, after the, even after the due date. But I've had this issue in the past where while the students were working on the work to attach, they got kicked out because when the due date, um, the, that boundary crosses, then um, system, I think, just kicks people out. Uh, so what you should be doing is what you've seen me do. Uh, basically, I've done most of the work here. And here, all I've done is copy and paste the work I've done elsewhere. Whether it's uh, you're taking photo of something that you've written out and uploading it here, or if you're doing what I'm doing digitally, um, the, I guess the main point is that you shouldn't be spending a lot of time typing things into this window where you could get kicked out and lose your work. <laughs> or do it on if it's gonna take you more than five minutes to attach something, uh, do it on some external software where you can uh, you have better assurance that you won't get kicked out in the middle of uh, working through that. So. So that covers the timed assessment, I guess. Um, yeah, and 